Hello, fellow travelers. I'm Nomad Jim, a retired, minimalist, solo, full-time slow traveler. Thanks for stopping by. If you're planning to sell your house so that you can travel full-time, or if you're planning to travel part-time and are selling your house to downsize to something smaller, or maybe if you're just wanting to practice some minimalism, then a question you're going to be asking yourself is, what do I do with all my stuff? So that's what we're going to be addressing in today's video. This is the second in a series of 10 videos I'll be doing that are covering things that you need to address before you start your part-time or full-time slow travel journey. So let's get started. When I finally made the decision to sell my house, I had about three months to get everything completed, including getting everything out of my house. So it was a daunting task, even though I had three months to take care of everything, because it takes a long time to go through and look at every individual object in your house and decide what you're going to do with it. So what I did is I created three piles for the things that I had in my house. So there was a pile for things that I was going to discard, things that I was going to throw away. Also a pile for things that I was going to either donate or sell. And then another pile for things that I was going to keep. And the goal when you're moving out of a house is to make that pile of things you're going to keep the smallest pile by far of the three piles. So let's start with the discard pile. These are items that you no longer want or need. They're items that you haven't been using in the past 12 months. You haven't touched it or used it. Or they're items that no longer have any real value. Nobody else would really be able to use that item either. This discard pile is probably going to be the largest pile of the three. So you may want to consider getting a dumpster that you put outside of your house from one of those companies like 1-800-GOT-JUNK. That's one way that you can do it to have a convenient place to throw all of those items into. But keep in mind that if you go that route, it's going to be expensive. It's a convenience to have a dumpster there that you can just throw items into and you're going to pay for that convenience. That's something that I did for some of the larger items that I had. And I can tell you from my experience, yes, it was quite expensive to do, but it was the convenience that you're paying for. Also, if you're in a hurry and you really got to get rid of things, this may be the best option for you anyway. So just bear in mind, it is costly to do that. The better way to do it is to just bag up your items and put them out with the regular trash that gets picked up on a weekly basis or however often your trash gets picked up in your neighborhood. But also keep in mind that the trash collection people may have some limits on the amount of trash that they can pick up from you on a weekly basis or the types of trash that they can pick up from you. So you want to check with them to make sure about that. I know that I have ran into that difficulty where the trash collectors told me they could only collect so many bags at one time from me. So I learned what that amount was and then I metered out my bags of trash each week so that I could get rid of it that way. It's the easiest way to do it, the cheapest way to do it as well. The next pile is the donate or sell pile. And those are items that you no longer want or need, or items that you're not really using anymore, but things that still do have some value to them, things that someone else could use and enjoy. You can give your donations to organizations like Goodwill or Salvation Army, and they'll take most of the items that you have from you. You just need to check with them beforehand to make sure that they will accept the items that you have. Sometimes there are restrictions on certain things that they won't take from you. Also, there may be seasonal issues with taking certain items. I know for me, I had a lot of Christmas decorations and I was moving out of my house in the summertime. So that was a problem. They didn't really want to take Christmas items from me in the middle of summer. It just wasn't the right season for that. So check with them just to make sure that they're going to be able to take those items from you. I use those organizations for a lot of my smaller items. For the larger items that I had, like furniture, I went to houses of worship, and that's another place that you can look, to churches, synagogues, mosques, temples. 
they are able to take items from you because they will give those out to needy people in the neighborhood. So that's what I did. I found out about a church nearby from a church that I go to, and they told me that was a church that would take furniture and things like that because they give those items to new immigrants in the area who are settling into an apartment, don't have many possessions, don't have any furniture, and so they need those items in order to establish a place in their apartment, in the residence, in the community. So it was, it was a good idea to do that, and I was glad I was able to do that, to help them out. And keep in mind that with donations, a lot of times you can get a tax deduction for that. So if you do give a donation, ask about getting a slip that will show proof of your donation. Now, there may be some items that you have that are of some value that you would rather sell than donate. In that case, you can use things like Facebook Marketplace, OfferUp, Craigslist, to sell your items. But just keep in mind, it takes a little bit of effort to do that. You have to take pictures, you have to post an ad, you've got to follow up with potential buyers, and negotiate with them. So these are things that will take some time. So if you don't have a lot of time, you really need to get out of your house, then this may not work well for you. May, you may just end up being better off to just donate those items. But if you do go ahead and sell them, these are ways that you can do it. I did that with some of my items on Facebook Marketplace, and I was able to make a little bit, a little bit of money off of it. So it was a good idea, but I have to admit, it was a little more effort than I thought it was going to be. The final pile is the keep pile, and that's the most difficult one of all. These are the items that you need, not want, but that you need to keep. And you really need to think good and hard and be very honest with yourself about whether you really do need to keep these items. Think to yourself, in five years, am I going to be wishing I still had that item? In a lot of cases, if you're really being honest with yourself, you're going to tell yourself, no, I really don't need this item. I want it in some cases. I feel like I want it, but needing it, I really don't need it. And there may be some sentimental items that are very difficult to let go of. And in that case, what you may want to do is talk to your children, your grandchildren, other relatives or friends, and see if maybe they want those items. But keep in mind that your children are not always going to want the items that you thought that they might want from you. I know in my case, my mother had two sets of really nice china that she was planning to give to my sister and to me. And neither my sister nor I wanted those items. So just keep that in mind that your children may not want those items. Don't be disappointed if they don't want them. Don't be hurt but just recognize that that may be the case. They may not want those items from you. So you may have to find another place to give those items to. So when the process is finally done, you'll be left with a small amount of items in your keep pile. And you may be tempted, if you have enough of those items, to get a small storage unit. And let me tell you from my own personal experience, that's a big mistake. I got a small storage unit for my items, and I thought it would be a really great idea to do that. So I got into my storage unit and had a really good price, and then within a few months, the rates started going up. And within two years, by the time I finally moved out of it, my rent had almost doubled for that very small storage unit. So it was a ripoff. I really think that the business model for these storage unit places is to get you in there with a really sweet deal to start out with and then after a few months start jacking up the rates and they know that you're going to put up with it for a while because your only other option to that is to move everything back out of the storage unit and put it into some other storage unit and that's a lot of work psychologically you don't want to go through that again so they know that and so they know you're going to put up with those cost increases for a while until you finally say, that's enough, I can't take it anymore, and you finally move out, which they're fine. They've already made a lot of money off of you. They can get you out of there and get a new sucker in there. So that's kind of how they work. So my advice to you would be get your keep pile down to a small enough 
amount that you don't need to have a storage unit. Now for me, like I said, I had a storage unit for two years and I finally came to the conclusion that I really could narrow down the items that I had in that storage unit much to a much smaller amount than what I had. So that's what I did. When I moved out, I drastically cut the items that were in there and what I was left with was a very small amount of things. And I asked my parents if they had a place I could store it. They have a little storage shed in their backyard. And they said they had a little corner that was empty that I could put my items in. And that's all I needed. It was just a little corner to put these last few items in. And so that's where I'm keeping those last keep items of mine now. And I know that when I go back there uh, and I see it, I still think to myself, I can cut this down even more. A lot of it is pictures and things like that which I really need to address that by scanning them and doing that sort of thing. It's a big project, but it's something I do want to do someday and something that needs to be done. So I know that I can reduce it even more than from where it is right now. And I'll do that someday as well. But bottom line is don't use a storage unit unless you absolutely have to. And if you do have to, get ready to pay a lot of money for it. So we've been talking about possessions that are inside your house. But there is one other possession that you do need to address, and that's your car or cars if you have more than one. So what do you do with your car when you're out traveling? So one thing you can do is to have someone take care of it for you. They have a place that it can be parked while you're gone. That could work. You just want to make sure that somebody is driving your car around every once in a while to keep it in good condition. You don't really want a car sitting there for 10 months and not being operated at all. It's not good for the car. So if you're able to do that, that is an option. Or you may decide that you really don't need a car. Maybe you can just sell your car because when you come back, you can borrow a car from family or friends or you can rent a car. And that's what I decided to do because I knew that I would be able to do that when I come back. So I went online, looked at several different places to get estimates from different car dealerships, also went to those places like CarMax and Carvana and got estimates from them all. And the best estimate that I got was from Carvana. And it was quite a bit more than the Kelly Blue Book value. So I thought that was a really good deal. So I went to Carvana with my car and uh, I figured, okay, they give me this estimate, but I'm sure once they look at my car, they're going to be like, oh, I, th I think we're going to take a little bit off for that. And that over there, well... We'll take a little bit off for that and the estimate would eventually come down but it wasn't like that at all they looked at it briefly we came back inside signed a few forms and it was done i got the full amount of the estimate that they had given to me initially it was in my bank account within two days very easy easy process very uh, very enjoyable process Never thought selling a car could be so enjoyable. So I highly recommend Carvana if you're ever considering selling your car. And the other thing about it too is that the day that I did that was the day that I left to start my, my full-time travel. So I showed up at the Carvana dealership with my luggage and my backpack. So after the process was done and I had sold the car, the gentleman there said, okay, well, we can give you an Uber to wherever you'd like to go. And he said, I'm assuming you want to go to the airport? And I said, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. And I explained to him what I had done about selling my house and how I was starting my full-time travel and that sort of thing. And he said, wow, this is great. So this is day one. I said, yes, it is. It's day one. And so I got an Uber from Carvana to the airport and I got on the plane to go to Istanbul and I've been traveling ever since. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe learned something from it. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. The next video I'll be doing in this series will be covering how to get your mail when you're traveling. So stay tuned for that one. Until next time, let's get out there and travel.